Okay, welcome everyone. Um, as folks are starting to trickle into the room, I just want to welcome you to the second session of the Expanding Empathy uh, Speaker Series here at Penn State. Um, this is uh, hosted through the Rock Ethics Institute. Um, this year co-organized with my, uh, my uh, postdoc, Dr. Martina or Orlandi, uh, who's a postdoctoral scholar in engaged ethics at the Rock Ethics Institute and Schreier Honors College. Um, I'm just waiting for a few more folks to slowly enter the room. And then we can, we're going to introduce both of our speakers. Yep. Interesting. Recognize some of the names here in the participant list. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so uh, as folks are entering the room, again, this is the second panel of, of the Expanding Empathy 2022. Uh, the, one of the themes for this year was to try to change up the format a little bit and have psychologists and philosophers uh, meet to talk about common themes. Every week we have a psychologist and a philosopher uh, give a short talk. And then we have the second hour set aside for dialogue conversation. Um, the way the, the, talk, the, the panel is structured, each speaker will give about a half hour talk or so, 25, 30 minutes, after which time we'll have a couple of questions for each talk. Um, but we want to save most of the questions and discussion for after both panelists have given their talks to really uh, bring out more on, the, uh, on that theme. Uh, before we get started, I want to acknowledge some of the support for the series in addition to the Rock Ethics Institute, uh, where this is part of the Moral Agency and Moral Development Initiative. Um, we also are getting support from the Social Science Research Institute here at Penn State, as well as their departments of psychology and philosophy and the Edna Bennett Pierce Prevention Research Center. And again, um, you know, the goal here is to try to stimulate interdisciplinary dialogue and see points of convergence and contrast. So with that, I want to turn it over to Martina Orlandi, who uh, will introduce our two speakers. All right, so welcome everyone. I just want to take a few minutes to introduce both of our speakers. So today we're going to welcome Jason DeCruz and Juliana Schroeder. Jason DeCruz is an associate professor and director of undergraduate studies in the philosophy department at the University at Albany and the principal investigator for trustworthy AI from a user perspective, a project that is funded by a grant from the SUNY IBM AI Research Alliance. Jason's work primarily is in ethics and moral psychology on the topic of trust, promising, rationalization, and self-deception. His recent work has appeared in Philosophical Studies, Ethics, Philosophical Psychology, and the Australasian Journal of Philosophy. Juliana Schroeder is a professor in the Management of Organizations Group at UC Berkeley. She's also a faculty affiliate in the Social Psychology Department, the Cognition Department, and the Center for Human Compatible AI at UC Berkeley. Her research focuses on how people make social inferences about others, and her recent work has appeared in Personality and Social Psychology Review, Journal of Experimental Psychology, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. In addition to that, Juliana Schroeder is also published with media outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Harvard Business Review, NPR, and the Today Show. So uh, Jason will speak first and will give a talk titled Calibrating Trust through empathy. So as we said, talk is gonna last about half an hour, maybe a little less, and there'll be time for a couple of questions from the audience. And then we will transition to Juliana's talk about the social consequences of mistaken assumptions about other minds. And then we will open the Q&A. All right, Jason, take it away. Great, I'm sharing my screen here. I hope you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great, excellent, okay. Go full screen over there. So first, I'd just like to start off by saying <clears throat> thank you so much to Daryl and Martina for organizing this really exciting event. I've never done something like this um, where you paired up philosophers and psychologists, got them to talk to each other ahead of time, and also um, you know, given them the opportunity to communicate and ask questions of each other. I think it's a really great idea. So thank you for organizing this and um, also to my co-presenter, Triana Schroeder, um, and to the Rock Ethics Institute um, as well. I'll start off just by apologizing a little bit for my voice. I've got this little bit of a cough, scratchy voice. Um, hopefully I'll make it through okay. I've got, I've got a glass of water over here, um, but I might take a break now and then um, just to cough a little bit. 
Before starting, um, I just wanted to uh, introduce my collaborator who is uh, in the audience today, not presenting alongside with, uh, alongside with me. Um, it's Will Kidder. Um, he is my former uh, doctoral advisee. He wrote this fantastic um, thesis, The Role of Empathy in Moral Inquiry, and has a bunch of really interesting papers that I encourage you to check out um, on Phil Papers. But he and I have really been working through these um, puzzles together. Uh, my work is mostly on trust. Will's is mostly on empathy. And so this was the purpose, perfect opportunity for us to collaborate. What I'm presenting today are really some very new ideas that we have about the connections between trust, trustworthiness, and empathy. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with what I think is quite an intuitive model of the relationship between trust and trustworthiness. And then I'm gonna bring out some complications in this model. So the model is basically this. I start out by counting on you to perform some kind of an action and thereby expose myself to the risk that you might let me down. So trusting always involves this risk of being let down, this risk of the possibility of betrayal. If you perform the action that I count on you to perform, you show yourself to be trustworthy. And that feedback comes back so that my trust in you is ultimately strengthened. If conversely, you fail to perform, then you show yourself to be untrustworthy and my trust in you is correspondingly weakened. Okay, so there is the basic model of thinking about the relationship between trust and trustworthiness. But then there's this complication. And the complication is that Ascertaining whether or not um, somebody is trustworthy will always require um, a good deal of interpretation. So here's an example just to get the point across. So suppose that I trust you to pick me up at the airport one night, but you are nowhere to be found. And I later learned that the reason why you didn't pick me up at the airport is that your partner needed to be rushed to the hospital or they were suffering from an anaphylactic reaction it would be impossible for you to warn me, impossible for you to call me. There was no time. Um, and that's why you couldn't do what I counted on you to do. So in this kind of a case, your non-performance, your not doing what I count on you to do is perfectly excusable and doesn't count at all against your trustworthiness. To the contrary, were you to come to the airport instead of helping your partner get to the hospital, I would never be able to trust you with anything important in the future. So it's precisely by not doing what I count on you to do that my faith in your trustworthiness is established. On the other hand, we can um, imagine a case where you do do what I count on you to do. You do come pick me up at the airport, but the reason why you come pick me up at the airport is that you think that um, I might be able to give your kid a summer job and you kind of want to curry favor with me. If you didn't think that I might be able to give your kid a summer job, you wouldn't have picked me up. If I learn that this is the reason for your picking me up and responding to my counting on you, I won't credit you with being trustworthy despite your doing what I counted on you to do. And so these are you know, very banal examples, but they're just meant to illustrate the basic point that ascertaining whether or not someone is trustworthy always requires this kind of interpretation. Okay, so here's an account of trustworthiness that Will and I have found um, quite persuasive. It comes from um, Karen Jones, whose work on trustworthiness is, and trust is really uh, fantastic. Um, so on this account of trustworthiness, a person is trustworthiness only if she's competent with, the, with respect to the domain of trust and would take the fact that A, that's the trustee, is counting on her as a compelling reason for acting if counted. If counted. Okay, so the thing to notice in this account of trustworthiness is that a compelling reason needn't be an overriding reason. And that is just to say that 
being a trustworthy person is compatible with not behaving in the way that a, per, that a person counts on you to behave. A trustworthy person might have even more compelling reasons um, to do something else. And were they to do something else, if they had more compelling reasons, this would not impugn their trustworthiness. And so in ascertaining trustworthiness, we face this epistemic obstacle. How can I know whether my trustee views my accounting on them as a sufficiently compelling reason to act? So this is the kind of thing that I need to know. And the, kind of, the answer that I'm gonna to try to give to this question of the epistemic obstacle is that in order to know such a thing, we need to be able to empathize um, with those who we trust and who trust us. Okay, so the basic idea is that empathy is a window onto another person's motives and we need to understand a person's motives in order to know whether or not their actions are indicative of trustworthiness. So empathy allows us to calibrate trust based on an understanding of the other's motives and not just their behaviors. So in trusting someone, we, what we need to know is um, whether our counting on them provides them with a compelling reason to respond. And we also further want to know how compelling this reason is for them, um, the reason of our counting on them, in order that we may know how vulnerable it's safe to allow ourselves to be. And um, I want to put forth the hypothesis that what, is, what allows us to know these things is to project ourselves into the perspective of the person who we're counting. Okay. So in trying to decide whether or not it's safe to trust you, I need to know that you care that I'm counting on you. And in order to know that you care that I'm counting on you, uh, we think that empathy plays this very special role. And here we rely on an account of empathy from uh, Amy Copeland, where empathy requires affective matching, other-oriented perspective taking, and self-other um, differentiation. So on affective matching, so an empathizer should feel what it is like to be the target of empathy to some degree, rather than just merely understand what the other feels at a kind of detached level. So when I empathize with your sadness or joy, I ought to experience in some degree that sadness or joy for myself. And in the case of trust, I think what's relevant is that I feel your goodwill and your concern towards me. That's what allows me to be able to trust you. On other-oriented perspective taking, um, the affective experience of the other needs to be contextualized by um, other-oriented perspective taking. And an empathizer needs to feel what the target of empathy is feeling, but they also need to understand why the target feels that way. And this understanding arises from an effort to share your experiences as if I were you, rather than as if I were having your experiences from my own perspective. So in the case of trust, I think um, this means that I apprehend your characteristically trustworthy motives by simulating your perspective somehow. And then finally, we need something like self-other differentiation where I don't lose sight of the fact that you are actually a distinct person who may take a different view of what trustworthiness requires. So I need to know whether you would think that it is reasonable or justified that I count on you in this particular way. Okay, so we started off with a, um, a really schematic example, but I think that when we start to think about trust in interpersonal relations, um, the thing that really pops out is how much of what we count on is implicit. So it goes unspoken um, and is never explicitly articulated. So here's a case, consider a case where two people are collaborating or co-deliberating about whether to make a high stakes move from one city to another. Um, so let's say you and your partner are deciding um, whether to take a job in a new city. So this is a complex decision, there's a lot at stake. There's your jobs, your friends, schools for the kids, 
the cost of living, different opportunities that may be opened and foreclosed by the move. And what you need is some kind of honest, non-paternalistic, candid co-deliberation about what to do. And this requires an enormous amount of trust. There's an enormous amount of this counting on relation um, in an activity like co-deliberation. So here are some examples of the sorts of things that you count on your partner to do. So you count on them to accord sufficient weight to your values. Um, and so if they don't do that, you risk that they're taking a kind of paternalistic orientation towards you. Um, you count on them to be candid about um, what they want most. If they're not candid about what they want most, then you risk that you're gonna face resentment in the future um, if um, they feel like um, they haven't got what they wanted. You also trust them not to exaggerate how disappointed they will be um, if they don't get what they most want. So the risk here is that they kind of manipulate you by expressing very strong emotions um, and um, they don't accord enough um, consideration to um, your desires or your values. But you also trust them not to supplement their desires or to disguise their true feelings. Because um, if they were to do that, then they would prevent you from realizing your goal of understanding what their goals are. So there's an enormous amount of trust and counting on in these kind of everyday um, circumstances uh, of close um, personal relations. And we think that empathy plays an enormous role in calibrating our trust in these kinds of questions. So empathy is going to have a role for the trustor, and it's also going to have a role for the trustee as well. So the trustee is going to have to answer questions like, what is this person counting on me to do or be? And in the case of the co-deliberating partners, that's a really subtle question, right? That's a question that requires that you project yourself into the perspective. Um, you also need to be able as a trustee to, act, to answer the question, what would constitute manipulation or betrayal in their eyes? And finally, you need to be able to anticipate how they're gonna interpret you. Are they gonna be able to fit my actions into a legible story of trustworthiness? So this interpretive work of creating a legible story of trustworthiness is kind of, it's a job that's done both by the trustor and by the trustee. So the trustee can't um, engage in actions that would be inscrutable or opaque from the point of view of the trustor such that they wouldn't be able to be put into a legible story. So there's an obligation on the part of the um, trustee here to co-create this legible story of trustworthiness. And this also involves anticipating what um, possible misunderstandings there might be um, going forward. Okay, so whether you interpret a person's actions as trustworthy or untrustworthy depends very much on what your starting position is. And if you antecedently trust someone, well, then you take an unguarded stance um, in your encounters with them. So that is, you will tend to interpret ambiguous actions as confirming a working hypothesis of trustworthiness. And when behavior departs markedly from your expectations, um, you're not gonna jump to the conclusion that you have been exploited or that you've been betrayed. So instead, you're gonna be guided by this rubric. There is most likely some good explanation. There must be some good explanation. Call that, I call that the justificatory scheme. So you view the other person's actions through this justificatory scheme. And then conversely, on the other hand, if you antecedently distrust someone, you take up a, a defensive stance in, or a guarded stance in your encounter with them, and you will be um, inclined to monitor them carefully um, because you appraise them as a threat. And their ambiguous behaviors um, are gonna be quickly interpreted as indicating exploitation or incompetence. So distrust kind of tampers evidence. It makes us insensitive to signals that others are trustworthy. Um, and your interaction with another person is always gonna be guided by either a justificatory schema, a skeptical schema, 
or some kind of middle state between these two. Um, okay, so I think Victoria Rogier puts it really well. She says, trusting and distrusting inhabit incommensurable worlds. Um, that is just to say that our attitudes shape our understandings of various events, and they lead us to experience the world in ways that tend to reinforce the attitudes that we already hold. So when we distrust a person, even evidence of positive behavior and intentions is likely to be interpreted with suspicion and to be interpreted as misleading. So when you trust someone deeply, you afford them a lot of discretion in how to respond to your dependency. That is because you are viewing them through this um, justificatory um, schema, um, there are a wide variety of things that they might do that you would um, continue to interpret as trustworthy actions. Um, so you're always going to sort of think that there is an explanation in terms of their care or their goodwill towards you for why they behave in the way that you do. And this is the explanation for why distrust, as this why for why deep trust is very risky. So in affording this kind of discretion in how to respond to your depend dependency, you also um, afford them opp the opportunity for concealment of um, untrustworthiness. I think a very interesting um, thing to recognize is that trust has this kind of recursive structure to it. So in a trusting relationship, I'm gonna trust you to interpret me through the justificatory scheme. So I trust you to trust me. That is, I trust you not to be too quick to conclude that I've been dishonest or inattentive or betrayed you or exploited you. I trust you to view me in a particular kind of way. And your encountering me from a skeptical schema is in itself a kind of um, betrayal of my trust. Um, so this comes out really uh, nicely in uh, this film by David Mamet called House of Games. Um, and in this film, um, one of the, the, the protagonists of the film is this con artist, um, well, two protagonists, so one of them is a con artist. And he's describing how con artists get others to trust them, not by trying to just offer evidence of their trustworthiness. That's kind of what an amateur would do. But what someone who's truly um, skilled does is that they try to persuade you that they trust you. And this is, a, I think, a very interesting idea that the trust of another person is disarming. And so Will and I have been trying to kind of think through why is it the fact this is such um, a effective strategy in persuading people to, to trust us. So we think that a trusting person, so if you think that someone is trusting of you, then you assume that they are gonna be unguarded in their encounter with you. And this means they're not gonna be controlling, they're not gonna be manipulating, and their actions can be interpreted at face value because they are trusting. Conversely, distrust is alarming. So when we notice that another person distrusts us, um, one thing that we know is that they now have a motive to be unreadable to us. That is to make their true thoughts and feelings opaque to us. That's because if you're distrustful of others, um, you don't want to be manipulated, you don't want to be exploited, and the kind of signature strategy for not being manipulated, not being exploited, is to make yourself, make yourself opaque. And so when we encounter someone who we think is distrustful of us, then we have reason to interpret their words and their actions um, with caution. So to answer this question, should I trust you? 
I often rely on my answer to the question, do you trust me? And in answering the question, do you trust me? Um, I need to project myself into your perspective. And here again, we see another role for empathy in calibrating our trust. We calibrate our trust by figuring out, um, interestingly, not just whether or not another person's got these features of trustworthiness, but what their attitude towards us is, whether or not um, they trust us. Okay, so I talked a little bit about um, these different schemas of the trusting person and the distrusting person. And I talked a bit about how distrusting means taking up this defensive stance um, and it often involves this interpretive schema um, of seeing ambiguous evidence as evidence of untrustworthiness. So there's a strong sense in which distrust is self complete So if you've got antecedently an attitude of distrust, you're gonna see untrustworthy behavior everywhere. Um, leads to this kind of practical problem that if everything is interpreted through the lens of distrust, how do you ever establish trustworthiness? So let's say you're on the wrong side of this and you know, other people are distrustful of you. Um, how would you ever establish trustworthiness with them? And you know, this isn't, it's not as if there's a simple solution to this problem. It's an it's a intractable, intractable problem for a lot of people. Um, but the question you're asking is, what would it take to overcome the other person's distrust? Um, and I think often what it takes is something like being able to display this credible willingness to be vulnerable um, in order to uh, bring about that kind of um, disarming mechanism that I was uh, describing before. Again, to be able to anticipate what would disarm another person, what would appear to another person as credible willingness to be vulnerable rather than just another um, exploitative technique um, requires an enormous amount of um, other oriented perspective taking. So let just finish on this possible application of these ideas that Will and I are thinking through. Um, and it's to um, try to give some accounting of this uh, phenomenon of what's been dubbed algorithmic aversion. So this is um, the phenomenon of humans distrusting AI systems or algorithmic systems, machine learning systems basically, to make determinations about trustworthiness. So say whether or not someone should be offered a loan or be given credit um, or have an opportunity for bail. Um, and People have shown an enormous amount of distrust of AI systems to make these kinds of determinations, even when the systems are you know, rule bound according to rules that people would um, reflectively endorse. And maybe, so one of our hypotheses is that AI systems are empathically deficient. That is, they are unable to see things from our perspective and um, since they're unable to see things from our perspective, they're always going to be sort of unmoved by the complaint, but my case is different. See it from my perspective, but my case is different. That is, we can't trust them to trust us because they can't um, um, project themselves into our points of view. And so we can, I think this is kind of clear when you think about the difference between, say, being sentenced by a judge and being sentenced by an algorithm, um, even if uh, you feel that you've been you know, um, wrongly judged by a human judge, um, you still have this opportunity to at least try to get them to see things from your perspective um, and to be able to um, uh, make a case for the interpretation of your actions as um, not being in the way that they may initially appear. And that makes the human judge trustworthy in a way that an algorithm couldn't be trustworthy. The fact that they're able to um, see things from a human perspective. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. Thank you, Jason. That was great. It was really, really great. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. I think a bit more than that, but 
Um, I'm going to dictatorially jump in with mine, if I may, and I may. So <laughs> um, I thought what you, what you said about distrust and in, when you're distrustful, you tend to interpret every signal, every behavior, the lens of distrust was interesting because I, and I wonder if there's a connection between that kind of attitude and rationalization. And I know that, that you've done a lot of work on rationalization. So I was wondering that because I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about my dad who has, has an extremely distrustful attitude towards basically anybody who's not within our family. And anytime I try to sort of tell him, you know, that this person, you know, acted well and means well, he always has a really good reason and excuse for why that behavior can actually be interpreted as not being trustworthy. Yeah. And I have to say this sort of scaffolding of reasons and excuses can get pretty sophisticated. And so I've often wondered, like, how do I cut through this rationalization? And you mentioned credible willingness to be vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, and I just wanted to hear a bit more about that and whether you think there's a connection with <laughs> rationalization. It's a great, great question. I, I do think there's a, a, um, a strong connection with rationalization, both for um, the defense of distrusting schemas and also for the um, unguarded um, trusting schemas. Um, that is, you know, when we're deeply trusting, um, we, all, we run the risk of rationalizing on behalf of the people who violate our trust and manipulate us. And then conversely, um, when we find ourselves in uh, distrustful schemas, um, then uh, we run the risk of always coming up with a just so explanation for why apparently um, trustworthy, um, honest, credible actions are uh, in fact uh, untrustworthy. Um, I think there's like, there's a good reason for why um, we deploy these kinds of schemas. Um, so, you know, it's important to be able to give our friends the uh, benefit of the doubt. Um, if we're not able to do that, then we're just not able to maintain relationships with anyone, right? So there's a kind of internal logic to the schemas where insofar as you value relationships with other people, it's important that um, you deploy that justificatory schema. And conversely, um, you know, when um, people have shown themselves to be exploitative um, or to be dangerous, um, it's important that, you know, when you get that uh-oh feeling that you trust it and that you, um, and that you shield yourself from their exploitative um, behaviors. But it's true that um, that kind of defensive um, schema risks a kind of paranoid distrust where um, it just attaches itself to all sorts of different objects um, and you are just, you know, um, always inclined to offer an, um, an uncharitable interpretation of the person's action and your trust is just completely, your distrust is completely and utterly just impenetrable. Um, and I think rationalization is something that makes both distrust impenetrable and trust um, often too deep and um, makes a person too vulnerable. So I see, see the problem on both sides and rationalization making the problem worse um, on both sides. But you do think that it's that both of them are potentially penetrable. Or potentially what? Penetrable. Penetrable, yeah. Um, I mean, it, in, I mean, there, there are certain, there might, there are certain cases um, where a person's distrust is so paranoid or so deep that you know there's just nothing you can do. Sure. And conversely, there are cases where um, a person's trust is so unquestioning, um, where you know um, there's nothing that the trustee could do that could ever convince the person that they're actually being exploited. Um, but I mean, there are certain things they can do. I think that. Um, in terms of responding to distrust, um, just depending upon this disarming mechanism is quite effective. That is showing that 
you're willing to be vulnerable to the other person um, can sometimes serve as credible evidence of your trustworthiness. That is, when you show yourself to take an unguarded stance towards another person, um, taking this unguarded stance is just incompatible with being highly controlling, highly manipulative. And if the person does think that you really are unguarded in your encounter with them, um, that can, I think, sort of dislodge distrust in an interesting way. Yeah. I just, I love this conversation around like penetrating distrust. That seems like, you know, the million dollar question when you think about a lot of the, you know, deep conflict that occurs in the world these days. And when you think like I've been doing some work with um, Jewish Israelis and Palestinian teenagers and, you know, the level of like historical distrust in those societies, you know, how, how can you possibly penetrate that? And, um, you know, one thing that I've seen in doing work with those teenagers is that um, what can sometimes happen is that they can learn to make like exceptions for particular individuals. So it's like, even though I completely distrust, you know, your group, that's an out group and we've had all this conflict and I've only had bad encounters with them through soldiers at checkpoints and so on. What I can say is that Jason, after having gotten to know you for a very long period of time, um, I now feel like I can somewhat trust you because I see you as being different from the rest of the group. But it's not, it's like a specific type of penetration because it's like you're making a, an exception for an individual. Yeah, that's right. That's an interesting kind of penetration because it allows you to hold on to all of your biased views right, about the other right. members of the out group, right? Um, it's like somewhat psychologically comfortable because it's like, okay, I'm seeing you as an exception. I can still keep my views about the other group. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It sort of makes me wonder, I mean, I thought it was a really interesting talk. And it, um, by the way, if anybody who's attending the, the way we're doing questions, you know, drop something in the chat function. If anybody has any questions for Jason, please just feel free to pitch in some, some now and we'll go ahead and uh, send them Jason's way. I mean, there's a number of, I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to a lot of the things in the broader discussion. And one thing this brought to mind, speaking of empathy and biases and so forth, you know, the idea of empathy is an interesting, is a signal of willingness to, or this idea of a signal of dependence and what that does for us within interpersonal relationships is really interesting. Um, and it made me think of some related work on the relationship between empathy, compassion, and honesty in relationships, um, you know, going back to the 90s, but then even more recently, there's some work on how feeling compassion for one identifiable person can actually, in some contexts, lead you to do things that seem antisocial. So for example, pro-social lying on behalf of that person, or um, you know, if, if you think of an example, if you're giving someone advice and you have strong compassion for that person, would you give them more positive advice that would make them feel good in the short term, even the expense of long-term development of that person's skills? And so there, there seems to be these interesting exceptions where sometimes empathetic processes and states may have conflicting like short-term and long-term effects potentially that interestingly like, dovetail with your discussion of trust. So if you're feeling compassionate for a person and they're trusting you to give you on the honest feedback, yeah. you know, do you tell them what they want to hear in the short term because you're sensitive to not making them feel bad yeah. versus knowing that if you do tell them in the long term, the honest truth in the long term will make them feel better. That, that, Balancing that through the lens of the relational trust, I think is really interesting from your perspective. That's a really interesting question. I think it brings in the importance of self-other differentiation in um, accurate empathizing, where um, what you need to take into account is what the other person is counting on you to do according to their own values, right? Um, so it can be very easy to like interpret that others always want, um, you know, more happiness or more pleasure or, you know, the, the easy lives or the difficult truths. Um, and you're not a trustworthy person if um, you too easily interpret them that way when um, what they really care about um, might be something different. Um, and I think part of being a trustworthy person is to project yourself into the perspective of the other person such that you really see what they are counting on you for, 
um, and not what you would count on them if you were in their position with all of your own desires and values, um, but what their values really are. So you really, in order to be a trustworthy person, you need to be able to see others as different from you um, and to make that self-other differentiation so that you can really do what they count on you to do. You can only really do what they count on you to do if you're able to um, see things from the perspective of what, of what their values are. So I think I see the self-other differentiation thing is really important to taking a non-paternalistic um, orientation towards others in being trustworthy, and that you're kind of untrustworthy when you take up um, a paternalistic orientation. So one thing I was wondering while you were talking, Jason, was how you think about like different types of trust. And perhaps you were getting at that a little bit with the idea of like deep trust. But I keep thinking like, you know, your, your last slide, which was quite provocative on AI algorithms, it feels just very psychologically different um, to think of, you know, the extent to which I trust an algorithm to pick music for me on Spotify, you know, versus like my spouse to love me for the next 100 years, like, um, you know, and there's, and so <laughs> they're quite different. Um, and so, you know, are there ways in which you have thought about different types of trust and how the model might apply differently to these? And in, like one thing that just intuitively comes to mind is like you were talking about this really interesting sort of like social dynamic, the dependency, where it's like, I may trust you to the extent that you trust me. And so to me, that feels a little bit more like sort of the spouse and not as much as like related to the AI algorithm, but um, I'm curious to hear what you think about it. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally think that we need to make those distinctions. The kinds of cases that have been interesting to me have been um, AI systems making quite high stakes decisions, um, say about whether or not, um, you know, uh, calculating recidivism rates and um, determining whether or not someone uh, gets bail um, or, you know, calculating or even things like um, credit scores um, and determining whether or not someone is proffered a loan. And these kind of determinations do seem like they're very close related to trustworthiness, right? So it's the systems that are determining the trustworthiness of the humans. Um, so it's different from the kind of Spotify case where they're just kind of anticipating what your tastes are gonna be. They're really making a determination about your trustworthiness that is high stakes for you. And I think that this is where a kind of algorithmic aversion or aversion to any kind of a system that can't view things from my perspective becomes important. So if I think that the person who's making this determination, it's like a loan officer, isn't able to see why you know these this year in my credit history is really bad um, because I had you know an abusive partner or I got really sick or whatever it is. Um, if they're not able to see from my perspective how my case is different, they can't be trustworthy. To me. So I'm especially interested in decisions that algorithms make that seem closely related to trustworthiness, to a human's trustworthiness, and um, decisions that are high stakes, and decisions where um, a human would really want whatever is making that decision to be able to see things through their perspective um, so that they could only be trustworthy if they could see things through their perspective. That's at least the hypothesis. Um, I mean, I'm kind of interested in the data, you know, if we felt that AI systems could empathize with us, rightly or wrongly, um, you know, if we were, and there is a lot of work in making chatbots appear empathetic. Um, so, you know, if we feel that they're empathetic on some level at least, are we more willing and able to trust them um, just because we intuit that they are able to see things through our perspective. I mean, my hypothesis would be yes. I think that would be a really interesting empirical avenue to, to go down as we Yeah, see. that's fascinating. I guess I also wonder what your thoughts are on the role of like transparency and predictability and, and, and our understanding. There's been a lot of work that suggests that um, people want to have like some understanding of how the AI algorithms are working. But you know, if we get to the point where they're having like the ability to take perspective and um, have empathy, um, you know, then you might have like a re 
reduction in transparency to some extent. And thinking about the human side of this as well, like I've thought a lot about um, whether people really want transparency or they just think that they want it, right? Because if you had like perfect transparency into like what Martina is thinking all the time, like, you know, I might uncover some things I don't want to know, right? Like, <laughs> Um, and so this seems like sort of like an optimal level of transparency that sort of could reinforce trust versus just tear it apart completely. I think the role of transparency is really interesting and much, much more complicated than it's been appreciated so far. Um, there's actually a great paper by uh, C.T. Nguyen, I think it's called Transparency is Surveillance, um, arguing that um, trust and transparency are actually deeply opposed um, with each other, and that when we really trust people, we don't demand transparency. Um, and that, you know, we're all deeply black boxes to each other. Um, in many ways, we don't directly inter you know, uh, intuit the inner workings of each other's minds, and yet we find ways to um, trust each other. So it's not really transparency that we demand. It's only when there isn't trust um, that we demand something like um, transparency. Um, yeah, so that, a couple of thoughts. I mean, I don't think the relationship between trust and transparency is what it's been assumed to be. Um, and I think there's actually quite a lot of tension between trust and transparency. I was really convinced by that CT1 paper. Um, and uh, yeah. That's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's more about seeing things from each other's perspectives than it is knowing exactly. Um, what drives decisions? There's definitely, uh, I mean, I, I love a good empathy AI uh, uh, discussion. Uh, there's a lot of, one thing that when you were mentioned it at the end, it brought to mind was just, I mean, in some ways, you know, you have algorithms that may actually, you mentioned may not be able to empathize, but may actually be able to predict our own behavior and preferences better than a human could. And so it, there, does, there are these interesting tensions where depending upon what, what we mean by empathy, like yeah. functionally speaking, it raises these provocative possibilities um, that I think we should return to in the discussion. Because uh, I do see, as Martina nicely points out, there are two questions in the Q&A. Um, let's briefly take these and then move to Juliana's talk um, in the interest of time. Um, the first question from Judith is, um, is the deeper trust that you posit possibly related to old school theories such as Erickson's notion of basic trust slash mistrust being the infant crisis in personality development? relating to things like secure and insecure attachment. Yeah, I do think uh, there's a, a good link to be drawn to uh, between what I'm calling deep trust and, it, and attachment theory. Um, in a lot of the economics literature, behavioral economics, and increasingly in the philosophy literature, there's this sort of presumption that the um, main value of trust is the extension of agency. So the reason why we value trust in the first place is that we're able to recruit the agency of other people in order to make ourselves more powerful. And I think that that's kind of, um, that's a blind alley that we've been led to from economics. And that the value of trust in extending agency doesn't go anywhere near in exhausting the value that trust has for us. And I think there's a deep value of trust for safety, um, for feeling that um, we are secure in the world, um, and we value that really deeply. And so um, this sort of deep trust where we afford a lot of discretion to the people who we trust deeply, um, we value that sort of intrinsically, apart from whether or not we're able to recruit the agency um, of other people. I mean, I think that think about the trust of someone who is um, getting old and might you know, be getting to the stage where they need to go to a nursing home or need memory help. Um, the kind of trust that you need with the people around you um, and the value that that trust has, it's got very little, I think, or maybe something, but not everything to do with recruiting their agency in order to make you a more powerful agent. It really is about being secure in the world and we value that um, intrinsically, and I think that's something we just don't notice enough. There's another question from Adam who mentions credit scores, which are well known to create disadvantages for certain groups. Adam asks, how can the designers of AI systems be better at trusting different groups so the algorithms have more empathy? Um, great. Um, so 
uh, I, I have a new paper on that with um, some co-authors called Humble Machines. Um, and um, some co-authors at, at uh, IBM. Um, and so I'm interested quite a bit in how we can change thresholds. So um, in, in ways that um, give apparently um, untrustworthy person, people, the opportunity to respond to trust in ways that are strategic and systematic um, and ways of answering the question, how trusted would the person be if trusted? Um, so there's this kind of asymmetry in learning between trust and distrust. So when we distrust something, we um, disengage from engage, we disengage from them, um, we don't put anything of value into their hands. And as a result, we really never learn how they would respond um, if they were trusted. Whereas when we trust people, we get a lot more feedback about them. Um, so there's this kind of information asymmetry between um, trust and distrust. And I'm interested in how we can tweak algorithms to get more information about how people would act were they to be trusted. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. It's something that, that I'm working on presently. All right, I think we should, we answered all the questions. We should move on to Juliana's talk. Great, okay, I'm hopping in the middle of my slides here. Um, okay, so uh, my talk will be a little bit different from Jason because um, I'm going to cover some empirical data, but I think that the, his models on trust are quite related. So I'll try to bring that in in a couple different places. Um, so I'll be talking about the social consequences of mistaken assumptions about other minds. And uh, I wanted to start with the quote from Aristotle, man is by nature a social animal that I think um, all of us have probably heard before. Um, the rest of the quote is actually quite interesting uh, and isn't as well known. He went on to say, anyone who does not partake of society is either a beast or a god. All right now this is a particular translation of it, but I, I like it because it really suggests that being deeply social is sort of a human, uh, a uniquely human phenomenon. And so um, rather than going through all the research, since this is a short talk, I'll just have you kind of consider your own um, life and what were the most sort of meaningful and important um, events that happened in your life. And probably you're thinking about times that involved other people as well. Like there's a lot of evidence that suggests that humans are, are built to be social in many ways. Um, and yet, of course, <laughs> We can all think of times when uh, we ourselves or other people uh, may be asocial or even antisocial. And so a lot of my research centers around this in, in different ways. And so, you know, one line of work I've thought about when we choose not to engage with others, like when we don't talk to strangers on subways uh, and so on. And then uh, when we ignore those who might be in need or when we, if we do try to help, we might help ineffectively. And then thinking about bridging social divides and the challenges there and when, and when dehumanization can occur um, in those contexts. Um, and so what I've thought about is that there might be a common psychological mechanism that can account for these different um, examples of being asocial or antisocial. And that's the kind of mechanism that challenges all of our social life, which is that there's this fundamental divide between ourselves and others such that you know, we can never have direct access into the minds of others. And so this kind of relates directly to the conversation that we were just having about transparency, right? So maybe having perfect transparency isn't great, but having not any transparency at all makes coordination and socialization just really difficult, right? So we have to use all these indirect tools to try to infer what other people are thinking and feeling. What could Martina be thinking as she's kind of watching this this talk. And um, uh, this is a philosophical problem that's been debated for centuries and centuries. It's called the other minds problem. And so the simple idea is that, you know, there are other people in the world around us that kind of look like us. They're kind of doing things like us. We just can't quite see into their minds, however. And so we just have to make these inferences that they must have other minds that are kind of like ours, but we just don't know that much about those other minds. And that creates all these different challenges for us. All right, and so I'm gonna um, talk about a couple consequences that I've investigated that are related to this other minds problem. And so one, there's really two high level ones. And so one is that 
it can lead us to, at times, misread other people's mental states. So that might lead us to misunderstand their preferences, their intentions, their, their attitudes, their opinions, their beliefs, and so on. Um, and so one consequence of this, and there are many, but I'm just gonna focus in on one, is that it can reduce the effectiveness of our abilities to coordinate and to even socially connect with others. And so one thing that we've proposed, kind of zeroing in, narrowing even farther here, is that um, they can actually lead people to be less social than would be optimal for their own stated enjoyment. A little bit provocative, we're calling it um, under sociality. And so I'll talk in more detail about that. And then the second kind of big consequence that occurs is that we don't just misread other people's mental states, but we at times overlook other people's mental capacities um, in the sense of uh, without having enough sort of attention and focus, it's easy to just kind of overlook the, the extent to which people have agency and experience like ourselves, just because other people's minds just aren't as vivid as our own mind. All right, and so one consequence of this is dehumanization. That's particularly something you see among outgroup members. And there's actually a new form of dehumanization that we've been investigating um, called demeaning. And this is one in which people tend to overlook others' psychological needs um, compared to their physical needs in particular. Okay, so I'll unpack all of this. This is kind of the high level of where I'm going. Um, so let's start with this idea of under sociality. There's a paper out um, now in Trends and Cognitive Sciences from our team that you can read if you want um, more information into in this uh, about this topic. And so um, I'll just start by saying that you know there's anecdotal evidence for people not wanting to be social all around us all the time. <laughs> so all you have to do is sort of look around. Um, and you can see people sort of avoiding eye contact with each other, trying to sit as far away from each other as possible, um, even though they're just, you know, standing in a waiting line, doing nothing, you know, they, they prefer not to engage with one another, right? And we now have these little devices in our pockets, these phones that are allowing us to be distracted all the time and give us a great excuse to be uh, really asocial. Um, but this doesn't necessarily, sorry, to, to the transition, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. Like there, you know, that might be perfectly great that there are lots of contexts in which we don't want to be social. And that's what's best for us is to not be social in those contexts. Um, but we run some experiments now that suggest that it might be a mistake that people are making, at least at times, um, to choose not to be social. Um, and so I'll talk about some data we've collected like almost 10 years ago now. And we've kind of continued to look at it for the last 10 years. We ran experiments um, on different forms of public transportation in Chicago. So here's an experiment on commuter trains that we ran. Um, this is what the inside of the trains look like. So basically people don't tend to talk um, on these trains, just like in lots of other contexts. Um, and so we ran the study. Here's a, a photo of us running the study where we would position ourselves outside of trains, the platforms, and recruit people walking by to catch their train to participate in a study in exchange for something like a $5 gift card. All right, and so here's the kind of simple design of the experiment. Before the commute, we would randomly assign commuters into one of three different conditions. And so one condition is the solitude condition, where we tell people to um, please keep to yourself, enjoy your solitude on the train today, um, take the time to sit alone with your thoughts. Another condition is the control condition. Um, don't make any changes to your normal commute. By the way, these are mostly people commuting into work in the mornings. Um, do as you would normally do. And then the third condition, the key one here is the connection condition. So this is the one where we tell them, please have a conversation with another person on the train today. Try to make a connection. Okay, uh, so that's the scary condition. Um, and then after the commute, we have them complete a survey about their um, experiences on the commute, having done all those things. Um, and so one of the things that we asked them about on the post survey is about their enjoyment. This is kind of the key dependent variable that we made predictions about. And there's actually one group of commuters that we hold out. They don't have to actually do it. All they have to do is imagine what it would be like if they did engage in these behaviors. So they're ones making predictions. Okay. So they make within subjects predictions. And so let me show you what the results look like in each of the three conditions. Well, they predict that connecting with a stranger will be the least enjoyable um, experience, whereas solitude and being in the control condition will be relatively more enjoyable. All right, and there's no real differences between solitude and control because probably in the control condition, they're picturing just being in solitude since that's what they normally do. Um, 
Now, it's interesting what happens when we actually have them uh, do it, which is that the pattern of results looks like the exact opposite. Uh, here, you actually see that people reported the most enjoyment in the connection condition and the least uh, in, the, in the solitude condition. Okay, so you probably have lots of different questions about this pattern of results, um, which you can ask me about afterwards. If you want, feel free to just put them in the Q&A. Um, but we've run uh, many different conceptual replications of this pattern. So it comes out sort of again and again. Um, we did this with cab drivers. We did this with people commuting on buses. We've done it in waiting rooms, like in the laboratory or in like doctor's offices. Um, and uh, most recently we published a paper uh, last year in JP General in which we um, did it in London, all right? And so one, one reason why we wanted to look at London was because um, people have different uh, beliefs about uh, cultural moderation, that perhaps this worked okay in like an area like Chicago or other places in the US, but it really wouldn't work if you went to London where people tend to be more curmudgeonly and they don't like talking to strangers. And so there it would actually backfire. Um, and so we got this kind of cool opportunity to partner with the BBC, um, who were, they were doing work on uh, a program called Crossing Divides. Um, and so they said, let's run your experiment here in tube stations um, in the London area. And we can even create these tube chat buttons that we will pass out to passengers in the connection condition um, so they can have like a reason to talk to one another. All right, um, and so it looked a lot, we ran it very similarly to the way we ran the other experiments. You know, we even had the same poster you can see here in this image set up in the train platforms and uh, the results like completely replicate. So people predicted that they wouldn't have an enjoyable experience if they talked, but in fact, in, the re in reality, when we actually made them do this, they did report that they had a more enjoyable experience. Um, and rather than uh, showing you all the data, I'll just say that, you know, even though connection was enjoyable, people expected that it wouldn't be. And this is exemplified by a really funny, like black market that popped up <laughs> basically after we were, <laughs> after we had started running the experiment, which is that people were making money off of this. They created all of these buttons that were like anti-tube chat buttons. So these are buttons that said like, don't even think about talking to me. Um, you know, I'd rather drink a pint of bleach than talk to you. Um, and so it's, you know, just kind of shows like how pervasive and strong people's expectations and predictions were um, that, you know, people like started creating these buttons and they didn't want to talk, even though if you just engage in the experience, it's actually, you know, surprisingly enjoyable. Um, so I thought that was funny. Um, so, okay, what's the psychology here? Why are people sometimes under social? And uh, what I argued earlier is that, well, it kind of comes back to misreading others' minds. And so how does that work here? Here in particular, what we think might be happening is that people misread or misunderstand others' um, preferences to talk or willingness to talk. Um, in particular, they underestimate people's willingness to talk. Okay, so here's a little bit of data. We asked people um, in another set of surveys, how interested would you be to talk to others? on like a zero to six Likert scale, and how interested would others be to talk to you on a zero to six scale? And um, here's some data from train commuters and bus commuters. And what you see is that the, those patterns look very, very similar across the different samples, that people report that their own interest in talking is kind of at the midpoint of the scale, like maybe I'm, I'm sort of willing to do it, but that everybody thinks everybody else's interest in talking is significantly lower than their own. All right, and so we actually think it's sort of a form of um, pluralistic ignorance. People assume that others aren't interested or willing to talk with them because they see other people with their headphones on or on their phones or the norms are that nobody does talk in those contexts. And so that's, um, that's cyclical kind of in a similar way that uh, we were talking about with, with Jason's work um, such that people then start to think, well, if nobody's talking, no one's behaving that way, that must mean nobody wants to talk. Um, even though it's not a perfect reflection of their true attitudes. And then if nobody, if everybody thinks nobody else wants to talk, then nobody starts talking in the first place. Okay, so the cycle kind of continues. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and this joins sort of a long line of work that's developing now, which suggests that uh, social connection is difficult in lots of ways, particularly um, what we'll call successful social connection, which is that the perceiver feels like they had a good experience. Um, it's a lot more sort of in people's heads than in reality, but 
basically people are concerned about how to start conversations and when to start conversations. And there's some work on that. Then during the conversation, you know, how do I know what topic to focus on? When do I ask a question? Am I going to offend the other person? And then how do I end the conversation? So there's some work that I have with my team that suggests that um, people often end conversations too soon. Um, and Adam Mastroioni has a paper that suggests that um, people never end conversations when they really want to because they're engaged in this sort of game theory of trying to guess when the other person wants to end. And so they kind of get it wrong a lot. And then also just tra translating our thoughts into language is difficult and that, that can be problematic in lots of ways. Um, okay, so that's what I'll say about um, under sociality. And then I'll just spend a couple minutes focusing on this other consequence as well that people can might overlook others' mental capacities um, and ultimately demean others. All right, and so um, what I'll say here is that the other minds problem, one of the kind of key um, assumptions that comes out of that problem is what's been called solipsy, which is that um, rationally, if you don't have perfect access, direct access into other people's minds, then you can't really assume that they have minds like yours. And so solipsy is like, um, I am the only mind that can be known to exist. Mine is that only mind because I only have direct access into my own mind. All right, but psychologically, of course, that's not how the world works. We don't kind of walk around our daily lives, you know, wondering <laughs> whether other people have minds at all, right? We just assume that people have minds that are kind of like ours, but there's this psychological version that I think remains from the problem. And we think it's better termed like the lesser minds problem. And so the lesser minds problem is the idea that because we don't have this great introspective access into other minds, what it leads to is this subtle belief that other people have sort of weaker minds than the self. Like others' minds are not as vivid um, as my own. I don't have as great introspection to them. And so I just kind of assume that others may have lesser or weaker mental capacity than I myself have. So, you know, it's kind of visualized in these, these funny images where like for the self, you constantly are getting input from your own mind. I know I'm feeling like nervous now or whatever. And so I'm, I'm having those experiences, but for others, like the input that I get is really weak. Like, what am I doing? I'm seeing if you kind of mirror your eyes right now, I don't have great input. And so because of that, I just tend to think of your mind as just not being quite as vivid as my own. Okay, um, and so what we've argued is that this assumption that others have lost their mind, even though it can be, you know, not, it, it, it's not necessarily malintentioned, it can just be, you know, basically driven by apathy, it's sort of an, an intuitive response to not having access to others' minds, in a way it's subtly dehumanizing. And so there's all of this literature, and some of this is in the uh, in philosophy on you know, what does it really mean to be human? And so you know, papers have proposed these different dimensions. But if you look across all the different dimensions, what you can kind of suggest is that in aggregate, it, it means having a capacity for um, kind of deeper, sophisticated thought and feeling. Like that is a fundamental, those two dimensions. I'd say are kind of fundamentally define how we think about mind, all right? And so um, this has been called like implicit dehumanization by some recent papers, all right? And so what does implicit dehumanization really look like? I'll give you an example, okay? And it's very, very subtle um, and, and not necessarily um, antagonistic per se. So um, here is an example that focuses on perceptions of others' needs. And so we start from the idea of Maslow's hierarchy, which I'm sure all of you have heard of and are perfectly familiar with, as are your moms and your grandmothers. I mean, we've all heard of this hierarchy. And so it's got these five different categories. And so you can think of, you know, the top category is the actualization and esteem as being purely psychological in nature. So these are things that kind of require mind. Like if you care about purpose and meaning in life, it's probably something that, you know, is, is related to, to really just mind. And then there's the social and safety needs, safety and belonging needs, which um, are kind of in between. They're both psychological and they might have physical elements as well. And then there's the purely like physiological needs, like needing to eat and drink and so on. And so you can think about the different needs as varying on lots of dimensions. Uh, but one that we thought was interesting was that it seems like they often, they also vary in terms of um, the extent to which they're uniquely human. All right, so the psychological needs are probably perceived 
to largely um, be relevant for agents that have mind, sophisticated mind like humans, right? You probably don't think of like a dog or a cat as like having those psychological needs per se, although it turns out pet owners are more likely to think about their dogs and cats as having those needs, which is funny, but I'm not gonna talk about those data. And then the lower level, those the physiological needs, those are ones that we could share with, um, with non-human animals. Right? So even like a cockroach probably needs to eat and needs to drink and so on to survive. All right. So um, now let me show you some empirical data where we look at people's perceptions of um, various individuals, various agents um, needs. Okay. And so what we did is we asked a bunch of people online on MTurk um, to judge the needs of eight different agents. All right. It looks like a really random set of agents that we use, but there was a reason why we came up with this particular set. Okay, so first we looked at um, individuals that prior research has shown are highly humanized. Okay, so yourself, right, you're always seen as like sort of the most human-like, um, a close friend to whom you would have access into their mind regularly, right? And then we looked at some agents that have prior research has shown are kind of mixed stereotype. So lawyers are often seen as like highly competent, but maybe less warm. These are stereotypes, right? Elderly people might be seen as being uh, more warm, maybe a little less competent. Children uh, seen as you know having ex experiential needs, but not having very much agency or competence. Um, and then some particularly dehumanized agents, like a homeless person, a drug addict. And then you can think of um, a, a non-human kind of comparison uh, condition, which would be making judgments about a chimpanzee's needs. All right. And then what we did is we asked these participants to make judgments about the importance of these different behaviors for these different agents. So for physiological needs, we asked about the importance of eating, drinking, and sleeping, safety and belonging. We asked about things like feeling safe or feeling loved. And then psychological needs, we asked about um, self-esteem, like feeling respect, um, self-actualization, like the, how important it is to live with purpose. And we asked them to make those judgments for themselves, how important all these things to you, and then to the, the target, the agent. Okay, so um, let me show you the results. So um, the y-axis is the full Likert scale from one to seven. So the perception of how important the different needs are. And then along the x-axis, you can see um, all of the different agents that were being judged. All right, and so first let's just look at the low perceptions of the low level needs. So here we thought there'd be no differences basically across any of the agents that everybody would see that all of them have um, similar physiological needs. Um, that's mostly what we found empirically. The drug addict is a little bit unique because basically people see them as myopically caring about drugs to the exclusion of everything else, even eating, drinking, and sleeping, which is kind of interesting. Um, you see a little bit more variance and distinction on the middle level needs. And then there's the most variance in people's perceptions of these higher level psychological um, needs. And so the data look um, kind of noisy here. So I'll just kind of take out the bars so you can just see the pattern of perceptions of those psychological high level needs. And what we think is interesting here is that, you know, there are certain individuals who are clearly people like a drug addict or homeless person, and people see their psychological needs as being more aligned with that of like a chimpanzee, like a non-human animal, than they see them as being aligned with um, them, themselves, their own needs, right? And so what we think is that, again, this is sort of an implicit way to capture people's perceptions of more human agents to less human agents. Okay, um, so you might be thinking, well, perhaps, um, you know, what, where is, where's accuracy here? You know, that, that maybe these different agents actually do have different needs, like a drug addict um, may actually report that they don't care as much about self-esteem and so on. And so we tested um, whether or not you would see kind of similar pattern of results, even with people in your own peer group. All right, so we've run this study. Um, we've conceptually replicated it with um, MBA students, both at Chicago Booth and at Haas, Berkeley Haas, where I am now. Um, and what we do is we just ask them about each of those same needs that I showed you before. And then we change this, the Likert scale a little bit so they re respond um, how much each of those needs is um, less important to me compared to the other average student or more important to me. And so what you see here is that anything above zero on the scale means that people are reporting that it's more important to them than to the average student. Um, and so you can already see that the scale is truncated to be above zero. So all of the results are above zero. Even for like low level physiological needs, people think of those as being more important to them than to an average student. 
Same thing with middle level needs, but the big effect is on the high level psychological needs. So here people really think it's much more important to me than it is to even a student in my own peer group. And everybody says that about everybody. Okay, so it's a closed network. And so it's interesting to think about various consequences of this. Like since I'm in a business school, one of the things I thought about is consequences um, in the workplace. So we thought about um, incentives. So there are extrinsic incentives that maybe might relate conceivably more to physical needs like payment, job security. And there are intrinsic incentives that might relate more to psychological needs like doing something that feels good and developing skills and abilities. Um, and so what we find is that, again, people say that both extrinsic and intrinsic incentives are more important to themselves than to an average peer. But it's particularly the case for the intrinsic incentives. So it's particularly those those incentives that seem to line up with psychological needs that people tend to think of as being more important for themselves than for anyone else, um, which has some interesting implications in the workplace. There's another paper that I wrote on this um, that basically shows that um, people sometimes feel objectified at work. They want more intrinsic incentives, meaning and purpose at work, which is kind of a natural um, conclusion from, from those other findings. Um, okay, so I will end there. Let me summarize. Um, so what I've argued is that um, people, because they just in, innately, part of being human, uh, lack direct access into other minds, this can lead to some problematic consequences that can lead them to, at times, misread other people's minds, it can lead them to overlook other people's minds, and there are predictable social consequences that come out of this. Um, so one I talked about was being, you know, under social, and I relate this back to misreading other people's willingness to connect. Um, and, and fear of social rejection is kind of related to that. And then I also um, show that people tend to demean others by overlooking um, or underestimating their psychological needs. Um, okay, so thank you. Thank you so much to the Rock Ethics Institute and to uh, Martina and Daryl for organizing this and Jason um, for being my, uh, my uh, colleague in this conversation and then the co-authors on this work. And um, if you guys have more questions, you can always go to my website. Um, and learn more there. Thank you, Juliana. This was absolutely great. Um, I'm kind of shocked that people try to make money off your experiment by with those pins that they that they created. That was that was interesting. Yeah, I think um, someone made a fortune off of those those anti tube chat pins. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I do feel like right. that's an interesting like new kind of citation citation metric. It's like how much has it inspired opposition um, that's the true yeah the predictions are like so strong that people like are not willing to try it and yeah by the way like one one concern about the experiments is like attrition in terms of people dropping out of the connection condition and so we have like several ways that we try to get around that like incentivizing them first and getting them to enroll in the study before um, they find out the instructions and so on. And the response rates are like above 90% in each of the different conditions. So it's, um, it's we don't think it's too problematic, um, but it's probably something that comes to mind for people. So there, there's plenty of interesting, I mean, just hearing your, your talk in connection with Jason's, there's a lot of interesting points of connection. And I do see um, one question in the chat here from Jelka who asks, she says, it's an interesting talk. How much do you think people learn from these affective prediction errors, e.g. first thinking they will feel uncomfortable interacting with others, but ending up enjoying these interactions? And how does this translate to future social behavior? The first thought is that people might have a hard time generalizing these positive experiences with strangers to novel circumstances or people. Yeah, it's a great question. We've looked at it in a couple of different experiments and we find some mixed results. So we've specifically, um, Jelka, what we've looked at is um, after having had the experience. So the, the participants who were enrolled and actually talked with a stranger and then reported that it was relatively pleasant, um, then are they more open to doing this in the future? Are they more willing to do it? And so um, in one experiment, um, looking at commuters on buses going into our laboratory, um, we asked this and pe there, people did not report being any more likely <laughs> to do it again if they were in that condition. And there, what we think was going on was like people were saying that, you know, yes, I had like an okay experience this one time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to have another good experience in the future, right? So exactly to your thought, Jelka, that um, people may not generalize. Um, but then we actually looked at it as well in the London experiments that I mentioned briefly, 
And there we actually did find that people that were assigned into the connection condition reported that they would be more likely to talk again in the future. Um, and they felt like they learned and they updated a bit. So, you know, mixed results. Um, I think that, you know, if you just kind of look at the world, it's sort of a wicked environment in the sense that people think it's going to be a bad experience. They don't try it. They never learn, right? That's what a wicked environment is. Um, and so what you would like to do is like to give people more experience and more chance to learn. Um, but I think that it might, the kind of learning might take a little while. Like it might be something that you have to do multiple times before you update your opinions and your beliefs about um, the experience. There's uh, another question from Adam. Who asks, uh, Adam, is, Adam is an old friend. He's asking ah, okay. when my book will be published. <laughs> yeah, when will your book be published? Adam, I'm working and on a book right now. But, is, is wondering about why, why is it named station to station training ourselves towards a happier destination? Yeah, I like that name. <laughs> That's fun. Um, I'm, I'm working on a book called uh, Reading People. Um, but it's, it probably won't be out for a very long time. So don't hold your breath. <laughs> Can I jump into question? Or so, so Juliana, thank you so much. I mean, I think that I'm really convinced that you've caught on to a real phenomenon with the um, under sociality. Um, I wonder if you think that there's a kind of um, parallel uh, phenomenon of over sociality where people will um, anticipate that being alone or being quiet will be a negative experience. I think people are really often very uncomfortable with um, quietness in the presence of other people. So, um, and I'm kind of having this experience um, where there's these differences in social norms, um, interacting a lot with uh, Japanese people and um, sitting at the table um, and norms about whether or not you have conversations and how much conversation you have at the table. And Westerners really, um, myself included, uh, uncomfortable with silence at the table. And I also think about things like, you know, silence retreats, um, where I think people might anticipate that, you know, having to be quiet in the presence of other people would be a really unpleasant thing. But um, I think people are often pleasantly surprised by what it's like to be in the presence of other people, but not communicating. Do you think that there's a similar kind of bias in favor of thinking that the absence of sociality would be really unpleasant? Um, so all of the empirical evidence that I know of uh, would, would not support that because um, I, do, I don't know about solitude retreats. I think those are interesting, but what we find kind of not just my work, but like Tim Wilson has worked on this, Dan Gilbert has worked on this, um, is that people don't realize how much being in solitude can make them feel unhappy. Mm -hmm. Not that there isn't value, great value to being in solitude, but it doesn't necessarily show up affectively, right? And so this is kind of why like solitary confinement is like a, a terrible punishment. Like it's like torture for humans mm -hmm. because we're just really kind of like not built to, to be that way. Um, and it can make people, you know, really unhappy. And they find that both among extroverts and introverts. Um, not to say again that there aren't like other productive uses of solitude. In fact, one of the things that we looked at in our studies was how productive people felt like they were being because sometimes people work on the trains. And so even if talking to someone makes you feel a little happy for a bit, it could have these other costs, right? It can make you tired, it can make you less productive, but actually we didn't find any evidence that it had any of those costs. Although people certainly predicted that it would have those costs. Um, but you know what I thought when you said over sociality, Jason, where I thought you were going was um, whether there are contexts when people, you know, they, they engage too much with others to the exclusion of like they, they can't satisfy other goals and things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and there are like contexts that are like that. Like I think about our MBA students and how in the first week of they have to network all the time. Like they're just, I mean, it must be like over social experience for them. <laughs> um, but so the reason why we don't think over sociality is as much of a problem as under sociality is because of what I mentioned about wicked environments, which is that um, when you're in a context where you're being like so social that it's exhausting, it's too much, um, it's people sort of recognize it quickly and they can moderate their behavior. Right, so they, they can react to that and they can handle that for, for the most part. I mean, it's, it's rare to think of contexts where people are like really forced to be social for long periods of time. Um, whereas in, in the context of under sociality, 
people basically never learn because they think it's not going to be an enjoyable experience. They never do it. And then they never end up engaging in it. So it's like a persistent error that won't get fixed, right? Because it's harder to update. Um, so for over sociality, yes, it can happen, but I think it can get fixed. Like it's not that psychologically interesting, but for under sociality, like it persists psychologically, which is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. So building on the point about norms, a uh, different Adam has a pair of questions in the Q and A um, about the interaction of people in public. Did you find that people tend to talk more when there was an icebreaker, meaning a unique out of the norm event that would happen say on a bus? You know, as personally finds it difficult to generate a conversation out of thin air without having some common ground to talk about. And do the might the buttons have helped create that sort of ice breaking experience? Yeah. It's a simple. Um, yes. One thing that's funny is when we ask people about part of you know why they don't want to talk with someone else, they they often bring up the start of the conversation and challenges and how to start the conversation. And people are like, "What am I going to say? How am I going to start the conversation?" And it, it's just, it's funny to me because like we've had a million conversations in our lives and like we know how to start conversations. And in fact, you know, we've gone back to all of the participants um, in our different commuting studies and we asked them about how do they start the conversation? Because we were wondering if people were saying things like, I have to talk to you because I'm in an experiment. Um, it turns out like nobody starts the conversation like that because that would be really awkward. People just, there's sort of like three ways in which they start it, which like these are totally intuitive. They either like compliment the other person. So that's a common one. They talk about some shared experience, like something that might be going on in the news or they talk about like the weather. The weather is like a third, a third category because it was so common. <laughs> um, possibly some of that was from Chicago, which has terrible weather. But, um, you know, so like it turns out that people really do know how to start the conversations. But yes, to your point, like the fact that they're concerned about it suggests that an icebreaker could be helpful. And we have um, giving people icebreakers, like just reminding them here are ways you can start the conversation, like even just giving them those three topics. Um, and we have tried that and it, it does help and people are more likely to start conversations when they have icebreakers. Um, but I don't know that it helps more than other things. Like for example, we've compared it to what we call ice makers, <laughs> which are giving people ways to end the conversation. So it's like, you might be concerned that this conversation will go forever and you won't be able to end it. Um, so let me give you some ice makers, uh, some ways to end, like you put on headphones. So it's sort of like just also giving people other information. And there you also see that rates of conversation go up a bit. So it's, it's not clear that like ice breakers are like the way to solve the problem. Um, and Liz Dunn and Jillian Sandstrom are people doing a lot of work on this topic and they've tested all sorts of interventions. So they would have a lot, some of it's not published yet. Um, so you can kind of look at some of their work and see what they've been finding with icebreakers. That's interesting. I like the idea of ice makers. I it can definitely be ending a conversation can definitely be more awkward and, than starting one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think people are generally more concerned about the start than the end, but- um, But the end is not not to be underestimated. Like yeah, that. and in certain <laughs> contexts, like we find like in planes, we've actually done this study on, on airplanes now. Yeah, because you're gonna be sitting next to the person for the next few hours, you start to think a little bit more about the, the ending concern. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's another question from Tarkin. So can we say people sometimes being under social is because they are lacking the experience how to be social due to isolation called by technology? Um, yeah, I think that's like one of the mechanisms. So that's one of the mechanisms that we look at. And if you look at that paper on under sociality, under sociality that's published in the Trends in Cognitive Sciences um, this year, we talk about like a couple other mechanisms that are involved as well. Like another big one that we focus on is um, people um, focusing too much on um, their competence instead of their warmth. Um, and so this is a cross context beyond just talking to strangers. We also look at things like being pro-social, like showing gratitude or um, giving people compliments. Basically what, and so like a common mechanism we find across all of those contexts is that people um, are concerned about um, their sort of ability. Are they gonna be able to do it well? Am I going to be able to have a conversation? Am I gonna start it in a way that the other person will appreciate? You know, and like, if I give you this compliment, am I gonna do it in a way that, um, am I gonna be skillful sort of about it? And in fact, the recipients 
don't care that much about your competence, the way that they interpret it is that you're trying to be friendly. So they just see like a good intention. Um, and so that's what matters to them. And so it seems like sort of the, the actor is waiting different things than the recipient is waiting. And so that's, that's a mechanism that we see that's um, common. But yeah, I think in general, the fact that we lack experience and um, technology, the way it plays into it is interesting as well. We haven't done that much research on that yet. Juliana, on the under sociality, over sociality thing again, um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how much we should trust people's reports of having enjoyed conversations. So part of what gives me pause is that there's so much social pressure to appear sociable. Um, and it's kind of, it's a strong term of derogation, especially amongst young people to describe someone as unsocial or antisocial. Um, and so to report that, you know, you really didn't enjoy having to talk to people kind of reflects poorly on you, given that there are these norms of being sociable. And I wonder if people are just kind of unwilling to report that they didn't enjoy the conversation just because it seems sort of like poorly on them. Yeah, I, th it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that um, if anything, the pressure would go in the opposite direction in the studies that we have, because for one thing, like in the London studies, we didn't do this in some of the earlier ones, but we actually have people make predictions right before they engage in the actual experiences. Mm -hmm. And then, so they might predict that, oh, conversation will be awful. And then they have the experience and they say, oh, actually it's pretty good. And so the psychological principle of consistency would lead you to think that people would have, they would feel more pressure to report experiences that are in line with their predictions. Cause it's hard to say you were wrong. And yet people do say they're wrong. So that, you know, makes me think that, you know, it's, it's actually interesting that they're, that they're probably reporting like, you know, their real experience. Um, the other thing is that, you know, there's no chance for the other person that they talk to to ever see the data, right? So that could be another thing is like, people are like, oh, what if the other person finds out? Like I better say good things, but there's no chance of that either. So, you know, again, I think people are probably reporting, you know, pretty much their true experience. Yeah. Um, but it's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah I think you can miss me on that one. Yeah, um, but by the way, kind of connecting that to some of your work, um, Jason, the guarded schema term, which I love, like that really seems to capture, you know, how people are thinking about engaging with someone that they don't know. Um, yeah. It's like, they're very guarded about it. Um, and, you know, how do you know whether they can trust? There's, it's almost, it's, um. I don't know if you would call it trust, so I'm curious, but in a way, there is some level of trust where it's like, do I trust that you're going to respond to me in like a socially normative way and that we're gonna be able to have a conversation? Like, do I trust you to be like a good social partner to me over this experience? I totally think that, yeah, there's something about having to be unguarded in order, especially to talk with strangers and to trust that, um, they're going to respond to you exactly in a socially normative way, not be rude and not uh, demean you or humiliate you uh, in any way. I would, yeah, it's yeah. sort of the trust by ver like trust but verify yeah. type model where, mm -hmm. um, and I think this relates to what we were talking about before in terms of social dependencies, where it's like, if I'm not sure about you know your motives or who you are, I don't know very much about you. Like, how do I start an interaction? Like, maybe I. I give you a little something and see how you respond and then give you a little something more. Like how does that kind of dynamic move forward? It's interesting. So it was really surprising to me um, when you find this disconnection between people's predictions of how pleasant they're gonna find these experiences and how they actually end up reporting them. I think that's super interesting because I have the sense that people often um, suspect that it would be a good thing for them to be more social. Um, that you know, making the phone call or going out to the dinner party and not staying home is going to be the better thing for them, the more meaningful thing for them. But they, yet they still feel an aversion to doing it. It's mm. kind of like exercise, like you know it's going to be good for you. 
but it's just hard to drag yourself out. I mean, that's, that's very familiar to me where like, I know it's gonna be good to make the phone call and, and reestablish that contact. I know it's gonna be good to, you know, go out to the happy hour, but I just have a hard time. And so I anticipate that it's gonna be good, but I have a hard time making myself do it. So it's kind of interesting to me that you find people predict that it won't be good. Um, I wonder if this is kind of, maybe a difference between the pleasurableness and the meaningfulness of something mm -hmm. where it is kind of, it's hard and immediately unpleasurable for me to drag myself out to be social or to make the phone call, not knowing the circumstances the other person is in or whether I'm gonna you know, uh, inconvenience them by calling them at this particular time. That's all kind of unpleasant for me, but I kind of do deep down know that these are meaningful things that I ought to be doing. Do you think that people sort of deep down know that these are meaningful things that they ought to be doing? I think there are different contexts. So I think that in contexts in which people might engage with someone who seems quite different from them, like maybe it's a stranger or an out group member, we also have a line of work on um, talking to people you disagree with politically, which is another context where people think it'll be truly awful, right? There's actually, Julia Minson has a paper on this and Charlie Dorison and Todd Rogers. Um, which is like another affect of misforecasting where people think it'll be much worse than it actually is. And they find that not even necessarily for interaction, but even just like listening. Like if I'm liberal and, I, and you tell me to think about listening to Trump for a while, like I think it's going to be terrible. But when I actually listen, it's a report. It's not quite as bad as I thought it would be. Um, so I think in those contexts, you would see more of kind of the mechanism of what I'm finding, which is like people don't even realize um, yeah. that it, it might be better than I expect. But then I think you bring up sort of a totally different context, which is like with close friends, like going to a party, like you might expect that actually that would be um, good, but then there might be other reasons as to why you end up not doing it. Um, uh, whether it's like sort of status quo preference, like it's just hard to like get up and go out there or um, like Liz Dunn has some work that suggests that even just sort of imagining being social, people think about having to like put on a face. It's like, okay, I'm gonna have to, I mean, you, you physically, like you have to physically put on a face, but you also have to mentally, like psychologically be ready to put on a face. And that, you know, that can just feel intimidating, you know, to people. Yeah, or, or depleting. Yeah. Depleting, yeah. So I think there's sort of other mechanisms going on there potentially. There is another, um... Side chat, Tarkin has another example of, you know, people who prefer to text or tweet each other even when they're in the same room and could have the physical interaction. It's perhaps one extreme example of that. I've done that myself, sad to say. Yeah, I've witnessed right. that too in the office. Oftentimes colleagues texting each other while being in the office. <laughs> and it's funny because I think, you know, I have another line of work on like communication medium and um, what we find is that text is like kind of a dehumanizing medium in lots of ways. Um, in the sense that it doesn't convey mind very well. So it feels so easy and efficient and it's asynchronous that it takes off a lot of pressure, right? Because you have a lot of time to compose what you wanna say and the other person doesn't have to respond right away. So it feels easy in that sense, but you know, it's actually very inefficient because it takes forever to like get things done, right? And there's like the most miscommunication happens over that medium because it's so easy to misread. Like if a person was being sarcastic, you might just, you know, miss it, um, which research has shown that you like need voice to be able to tell complex intentions like sarcasm and humor and other things. Um, so like I see the appeal of text. I myself, like <laughs> I like to text people, but like the research is like pretty clear that it's it's not like an optimal medium for like most human social interaction. So I do have one question that sort of builds upon your two talks. I mean, I think one of the most interesting common threads I'm seeing is just the misperception of cues around different aspects of emotion and social interaction, whether it's trust or just the benefits and cost of conversations. Um, I mean, a lot of this, I've been a lot of discussion and debate about empathy and how people sh should, could approach it, whether it's worthwhile for these sorts of things. And Jason, you're saying it can be a useful guide for the trusting process. Um, and I'm just, and then Juliana, you mentioned sort of wicked environments. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering, like, if people are misperceiving um, some of the emotional tools and the nature of the environment that could have these interactions in, you know, 
if there are certain inhibitors that are in place that are preventing people from empathizing, let's say, and getting to that place of trust where they can then willingly enter these social interactions and get these positive benefits that Juliana's talking about, like what could we do with some of these environments to, to disambiguate, to, to clarify some of the contextual cues so that people can see they're like, if I'm willing to be vulnerable, I put myself into a situation where I can get this empathy and trust. And then as a consequence, get these positive social relational benefits. Like how, what are the, what could we do to structure choice environments and choice architectures to help like reveal some of these benefits to people? I love that question. I mean, I, I've thought a lot about that in the context of like social engagement. Like we've, I've talked to like urban city planners who are thinking about, you know, what are ways in which we can structure environments to increase socialization. Um, but I, I haven't thought about it with relation to trust. It's like, it's funny to think about like someone wearing a sign, like I'm trustworthy. Like that would be like almost suspicious, right? But in terms of like increasing socialization, this goes back to the icebreaker idea a little bit. You know, you basically, can we strategically place benches so that they face each other instead of facing away from each other? Like I showed you an image in my slide deck of like a waiting room where all the seats were facing away from each other. So they were like specifically compartmentalized. So, you know, people can kind of do work. But it's like kind of very antisocial in a way. Um, um, and then like I mentioned, Liz Dunn and Julian Sandstrom, they've done work where they, you know, they basically give people more sophisticated versions of tube chat buttons in which, you know, they're color coded. So red, yellow, green, green meaning talk to me, yellow meaning maybe, and red meaning don't talk to me, right? And, but they've found some sort of mixed results on whether that actually increases socialization as, a, as opposed to decreasing it, um, so. Yeah, on, on the trust side, um, I think that we really we underappreciate um, the consequences of misplaced distrust a lot. Um, so we tend to think about trust as the risky proposition and distrust as the risk averse proposition. But there are a lot of real risks involved in misplaced distrust. So these are risks of um, Wrongly insulting people, um, marginalization, um, and I don't think we think enough about those kinds of costs in designing social institutions. And so, to think more about the hazards and the risks of misplaced distrust, I think is important. Yeah, and just the idea that you know, if you start in a place of distrust, it's very hard to get to trust. You know, if you start in a place of trust, it's easy to get to distrust because as soon as one person does something wrong, if you think about like prisoners' dilemma games and other economic games, like you know, you you start in the place of trust and then you quickly get to distrust. If you start in the place of distrust, you can never get to trust. It's very hard to do that. Um, this reminds me of you know thinking about different forms of negotiation, like integrative negotiation, where your value you can grow the pie versus like distributive negotiation, where everything is zero sum. And with the distributed negotiations, people come in with the distrust mindset, like mm -hmm. it's zero sum. So if I lose my resource, I'm never going to be able to get it back. Um, whereas in the integrative negotiations, sometimes they can start with the trust mindset, but it, it can still go to distrust. Um, but one of the things that like we always tell our student, I teach negotiations, what I tell my students um, is to um build like rapport for like five minutes before you start the negotiation which is like helps to put them more in a place of trust um but not perfect but something we try I need to have my so. corner the next time there's a salary negotiation for sure <laughs> yeah i've actually really wanted to do research on the idea of common ground and whether like building common ground helps and what type of common ground does it have to be like integral to the negotiation context or whatever the disagreement is, or could it be something ancillary, like, you know, I have kids and you have kids and like, we have that in common, you know, can we now have a better negotiation? Um, I don't think there's good research on it. So I think it'd be a good, it's a good topic to study. I do think it's interesting how trust can move across domains where earning someone's trust in a completely unrelated domain can really be effective in, um, winning their trust in a totally separate domain, right? So it's like, 
you know, learning that someone is trustworthy when it comes to coaching a little league team that's got so little to do with their competence and all sorts of other tasks. But I, I would bet that, you know, we're much more inclined to trust people uh, across domains. So trust is kind of domain promiscuous in this, um, in this, in this interesting way. That's interesting because what that's if that's true, which I mean sort of seems like the halo effect, but I wonder like how strong those correlations between the domains are. Mm -hmm. um, then you know what it seems like you could do is like show that you've been trustworthy in some other domain. Like I'm gonna put forth my credentials mm -hmm. in whatever thing. Um, and that would help. No, it probably depends a lot upon whether or not the domain is related to competence or goodwill. So if the trust is all about competence, then the fact that Someone's a good little league coach isn't gonna like make you trust them to fly the plane. Um, but if the trust is mostly about goodwill, the fact that someone's a good little league coach does show qualities of character that are gonna be moral character that are gonna be relevant to trust in other domains, I think, um, that require goodwill. Yeah, that makes, I think that feels right to me too. Mm -hmm. So there's a question from my colleague Jana um, on the side here that it gets the maybe the part about common ground to some extent, but also trust in relation to morality, warmth. Um, she writes, she's thinking about insufficient trust, such as distrusting climate scientists, projected impacts of climate change, destroying trust with attacks on public health officials like Fauci, um, and too much trust, like initial reactions to various scandal of sexual abuse of athletes. Um, you know, do you, so relating that, do you have any thoughts about self assessments about when and who they should be, people should be trusting more versus trusting less? Ah, so self assessments of one's own capacity to judge trustworthiness or untrustworthiness. Are those the kind of self assessments. So, I mean, there's this interesting connection between like experience of betrayal of trust and the effect on self-trust and it feels so meta because it's like do you trust yourself to be able to tell who to trust that's right that's right it sounds very abstract but i think it's it's really important um, and manifests itself all the time where um one underappreciated risk of trusting is that in having your trust exploited or betrayal or betrayed, then your own trust in your ability to discern trustworthy and untrustworthy parties is um, diminished. Um, and so in trusting, you don't just put at risk the thing that you know you put into the other person's hands, but you also put into you know, put at risk your own um, faith in your capacity to discern. Um, and I think that's a really good point. I mean, I, I guess a question is how to be resiliently trusting. That is, how to be the sort of person where um, betray for whom betrayal is not always a catastrophe. Um, and betrayal doesn't mean that um, you can't understand other people at all, or you can't ever make reliable judgments of their trustworthiness or untrustworthiness, um, or judgments about you know how they relate to you or what they think of you. I think often, we have a strong tendency to interpret um, failures of trustworthiness to always be about us. So that is when someone shows themselves to be untrustworthy, we have this tendency to um, think that the explanation is that they don't respect me enough, where um, it might not be that. It might just be that they're being um, inattentive or that they're distracted or that they're just subject to temptation. Um, so betrayals of trust aren't always about you. And I think if you can like see that betrayals of trust aren't always about you, you'll be less likely to catastrophize a betrayal of, tr a betrayal of trust. And if you're less likely to catastrophize a betrayal of trust, you're less likely to like, I think, um, lose faith in your own ability to discern when other people are um, trustworthy and untrustworthy. Yeah, I was going to put forth like the, a very similar hypothesis, which is that it's probably about attributions. So um, if there's a betrayal of your trust, do you attribute it to yourself or do you attribute it to the other person um, or something else, like something in the, in the environment? Like, perhaps they were generally trustworthy, but in this one case, 
they, you know, they betrayed your trust because of something that happened in the environment, some situational factor. Um, so that, that attribution that you make afterwards seems really important. You can imagine being able to move that around in different ways. It seems like especially, you know, after having engaged in conversational effort or empathic effort, like any sort of investment relationally, whatever that was, you know, then that would further feed into possible like internal attributions or at least some sort of regret, you know, for having put forward all that emotional energy into that to then see that sort of thing happen. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, how we think about the relationships evolving over time. You know, it does seem like a, a thing that's coming across from both of your presentations and some of the questions as well. You know, thinking of recent um, recent work by I think Shimei Suri and colleagues looking at adaptive empathy and the idea of when you put yourself out there and empathize with someone, you know, on what basis do you do so? But then also what are the consequences of doing so? Like what is the feedback you get in terms of direct reinforcement of an empathic encounter or any social encounter? Um, but then also what do you learn from it? And what are the theories you bring to bear as you then enter into those interactions and how do those sort of recursively build over time? It's, there's a lot of food for thought with like with that perspective and then bridging to yours as well. Um, yeah, I agree. I also think like Janet, those examples were so great that you provided. Um, it's interesting to think about when you trust someone or some group and then others are, tr are trying to degrade that trust, you know, or the environment might be doing something, like there's something that degrades that trust. And so how does that kind of factor into your calculation? Right. And so maybe, you know, one psychologically comfortable way of handling might be like you distrust those that are trying to you know reduce your trust in the thing that you sort of like intuitively trusted um so that might be one way to handle it or maybe it's sort of easy again going from like trust to distrust maybe that's easy so as soon as you have like a little bit of reason to doubt then maybe people like pretty quickly move to distrust um, or it might be context dependent hmm. so we have a few minutes left for anybody else who has any questions. Um, there's plenty of things we could talk about continuing from discussions earlier. The, the AI ethics question is perpetually interesting, for example, is one to return to. Um, but if anybody else has any questions, please do chime into the chat. Um, Jason, I was thinking back about your point about the damage that distrust can cause towards marginalized communities. And I was wondering if, if it can go both ways, kind of like what Miranda Frickers argues with epistemic injustice that the nowhere also misses something when performs epistemic injustice. So when you distrust others, you're also missing out potentially on something, whether that's you know opening up to people, asking for help when you need it. Um, the damage on marginalized communities definitely seems more like magnified, uh, but I'm wondering if there's also in a, a sense in which distrust can also makes the person who distrust miss out on something as well. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, so I think we rightly focus attention on those who are yeah. um, <clears throat> wrongly mistrusted or baselessly mistrusted, because there seems to be a kind of injustice there, right? Yeah. Being, especially not just being inaccurately distrusted, but being baselessly distrusted. Um, there's a special concern about that. Um, but so yeah, an example that really comes uh, to mind quickly is in the 1970s. There were this is um, you know a lot of there are a lot of sort of crime wave and um, there's this buzzer system on a lot of stores where in order to enter into a store, um, you need to press on a buzzer and then the people the person inside the store would look through the shop window, check you out and then decide whether or not to um, let you in. And you know there were a lot of um, rightly angry. Um, expressions in newspapers at the time, people from minority communities who were sort of um, baselessly mistrusted based on their appearance not to be let into um, a store. And so there we have like this concern of the injustice of baseless distrust. But you're totally right that, you know, the store owners um, were foregoing opportunities for customers. <laughs> Uh, for going opportunities for you know their business to to thrive um, as a result of uh, baseless mistrust as well. So there are 
for costs uh, for going opportunities, I think, um, as well as uh, concerns about the insult uh, and the marginalization of racist distrust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one thing that we've been thinking about a little bit too. I mean, it goes back to the million dollar question of, you know, how do you penetrate when there's widespread distrust against an entire group, right? And just the stereotypes and the, Janet just talking about prejudice in the chat here, um, the prejudice that you can have that you would, you know, generalize to the entire group. And like a lot of, there are a lot of organizations now in the US that are thinking about like political divides since that has become, the political divide has become a little more extreme in the past, you know, couple of years. Um, and one of the mechanisms by which they think it can be bridged is through like conversation. Um, but then you have to think about like, what are all the different elements of that are required to make like a good conversation, right? And so like one thing we've been finding is that text-based conversations have a lot more ambiguity. And so you see a lot more um, stereotypes tend to be stickier. So if I have a stereotype about your group and I don't trust you, what I can do is I can sort of read into your responses in such a way that it confirms all my biases and I see like reinforcement of my prejudice towards you. But if it's a voice conversation or if you can see the other person, both of those things, um, then it becomes harder to like maintain the biases. And in fact, we found that voice without video, so like having the audio without the video might be kind of the best of all.